Professor Dan Smaiji, you're Director of trans Studies at Yunnan Minso University in China. Your work combines anthropology and religious studies in research in Tibet, and you also make documentary film. Now, Tibetan studies, that's an old field of research, but you speak of trans Himalayan studies. Now, what kind of region is trans Himalaya? Um, I will begin with the regions, but I will also add what trans Himalaya means in the conceptual sense. So the region is greater than the traditional Himalayas uh, uh, conceives. Traditional Himalaya study usually focuses on Nepal and uh, Hindu Kush Himalayas, that range and mostly focus on the mountains and a bit of foothills. But uh, Trans Himalayas, in geographic sense, is really about elements of flows and tying into other places. So for instance, uh, Himalaya produces tons of water, ice. And so by looking at its rivers and the geological structures, so geographically, Trans Himalayas also include highlands in southwest China, and Southeast Asia, and the extension of Tibetan Plateau. So by looking at that geographic coverage, that allows me to develop a new kind of a study. I call it transboundary area studies. This is what I'm working on. So the concept of trans-Himalaya studies is a trans-regional study, or as a world region study, an extended area, but traditionally eco-geologically all connected. This is what I meant by trans-Himalaya studies. So moving from Tibetan or Himalayan studies to trans-Himalayan studies, uh, it is to bring in a new uh, concept, a new notion that we work with. But what does that mean to our conceptualization of Asia? How does that me mean, how does that make us see Asia in a new way? We do need to look at Asia in a new way because um, especially after World War II, Area studies oftentimes map each area is mapped onto each country. So the geographic country is a geographic area study. And to me, this is wrong, given the, uh, con uh, the context of globalization and given the many historians' recognition of pre-modern connections, then we need to look at Asia as interconnected the region. Let's say, um, many scholars uh, propose the idea of inter-Asia. So when I look at uh, Trans-Himalaya region, it is an inter-Asia region. So it, is, it could be called inter-Asia study. And when I look at China, for instance, look at Tibet, for instance, look at Mongolia, for instance, all of them historically had encounters in the imperial sense, livelihood exchanges in many ways, and uh, so these areas could all be called inter-Asia regions. So this is what I'm trying to promote and uh, going beyond the national boundaries. Yeah, but so what could you exemplify? I mean, if we're, we are so used to the nation state boundaries and uh, Tibet is today a part of, of China, the Republic of China, yet it is often seen as a region of its own. But trans -Himalaya, how can that make us um, force new questions into the conversations? Um, this really had to do with several fronts. So first of all, uh, modern Tibetan studies is exceedingly political besides um, its academic uh, area study. And political in the sense is that since the, the end of the uh, uh, Qing Dynasty or the Manchu Empire, that Tibet rel relatively was on its own and since the uh, Republic China had little control over it, the many historian, Tibetan study historians recognize that. And then sliding into the World War II and the Cold War era and uh, different uh, ideological camps on earth are fighting with each other. So Tibet, Tibetan study a lot of times focused so much on territorial disputes. And to me, that's only one uh, element of Tibetan studies. And we need to look at Tibet, Tibet in, in a different aspects. So then, since you mentioned Tibet became part of a, a, a People's Republic China, it is politically, economically, it's all integrated. So there must be interactions between Tibetans and non-Tibetans. 
this is the approach I have. And then put Tibet in the Trans-Himalayan regions is because Tibet historically was an empire, had an influence in the southern Himalayas, had a Buddhist uh, 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 pilgrimage routes with uh, India and Nepal. So by place Tibet in the Trans-Himalaya context, it's actually give us a, a bigger picture and easier to understand that Tibet was not isolated at all. It was connected with many other parts of the world. So uh, it's, it's a good, it's healthy thing to do, especially for modern Tibetan studies. Yeah, we are now, uh, as we are talking, we are in Kunming, uh, which is the capital of the province of Yunnan. So we are in southwest China. Now this is the most uh, ethnically diverse province in China, and it is an ecological hotspot. Uh, in daily conversations here in China, people will be talking about nations, uh, but you talk about being indigenous. Now, what does that make uh, of our understanding of uh, people, people as communities and groups, if you compare talking about people as nations or as being indigenous? Um, I can only comparatively speaking about uh, ethnic diversity. We can lo look at the Russia, we can look at the United States. Maybe you take the United States as a comparative uh, point with the chi China's ethnic diversity. In the United States, majority of the people uh, are descendants or recent immigrants from elsewhere except the Native Americans. And then when look at China, actually everyone is indigenous. I mean, I could say some uh, um, Hui people, let's say the Muslim, their paternal side came from Middle East. But other than that, I could see everyone is indigenous in a sense. And uh, the nation part is because of the modern nationalistic education of the country that people are very cautious of saying this phrase all the time. And it does have a political value as well as a academic value, scholarly value to understand how nation is being branded on human consciousness. So the indigenous part is that uh, the, this province before PRC identified the 26 ethnic groups, actually there, lot, there were close, over 200 ethnic groups they claiming themselves they're unique. So the state uh, ethnologists had to lump some of them together because of linguistic connections, livelihood similarities, and uh, customs, cultural habits. So some of them are lumped together as one group. So then it's easier for the management of the nation. So now we have uh, 25 ethnic minorities in this province and one majority population, which is the Han population. So this is the ethnic configuration of this province. And uh, still, you don't often use, I, I barely hear you speak of nations. You speak of being indigenous and indigenous people. And that's something else. I mean, indigenous people mm -hmm. as a concept, we are familiar with that in other parts of the world. Uh, Using it here in China, does that make a difference to the way in which you analyze the situations that you research? Uh, by using indigenous, as particularly in this province, is that uh, it's out of my respect, uh, out of my intellectual recognition of many people, peoples have been here for a long time. And uh, we can't say where they came from, but they've been here just a long time and that uh, their indigeneity is respected. Now, there is another dimension of my work really has little to do with, let's say, identifying particular group as indigenous. And I claim everyone on earth is indigenous. Either you have direct indigenous experience or you have indigenous memory based on where you came from and how your ancestors taught you. And then plus, indigenous, as far as I can recall, the etymology has to do with the birth, has to do with a place where you were born, a person is born, a person is growing up, etc. And also I recognize that being indigenous does not mean that people don't move. People move all the time. And uh, look at Scandinavian countries, you have circumpolar peoples that they migrate 
They sometimes they migrate to uh, Siberia also, and then they meet with the Siberian indigenous people and reindeers meeting each other, but different kind of stuff. <laughs> so this happens uh, uh, all the time in history, it's, except that uh, in the modern era, people move a lot more and uh, with a high, frequ high frequency. So then indigenous to me has a value for what I do. I call it environmental uh, humanities and many other scholars are also doing. And we're trying to figure out a new kind of a planetary environmental ethics. And it's the human universal that we need to see, we need to understand the earth has so many human induced problems. Now, if we say you're indigenous, I'm not indigenous, who is responsible for what, we, for what we do? I mean, you can point fingers all the time, but it looks like for the last um, five or six decades, people have done that, but nothing improved. So the thing is that we need to find the universal ground that we all stand on, and I call it the indigenous. And I can't find any other word for that. It's a philosophical, it's ethical, it's also affective. We can stop here. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>